Sure. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our final lecture of the 21-22 uh, public lecture series for the Delaware County Institute of Science. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. King and Dr. Gurdon for their uh, organization and participation in this lecture series. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say if any of you want to Google us on the web, uh, Delco SciMuseum.org, Delaware County Institute of Science, and I personally had the chance to participate in uh, one of these cruises many years ago, and it really is some of the best aspects of science in the pursuit of knowledge. So with that, I'll turn it over to our hosts. Thank you. Great, thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Laura Gurton. I am a professor of earth science at Penn State Brandywine. At least that's typically my day job, but for two months I am currently on the South Atlantic Ocean. So I am on the oceanographic research vessel Joides Resolution. And what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about the ship and in the spirit of the Delaware County Institute of Science, which focuses a lot on science history. I'll talk a little bit about the history of ocean exploration and how we got to where we are today. Then I'll take you on a tour of the ship. We'll go into some of the labs. We'll meet some people on board and I'll try to get as many of your questions answered as I can within the time that we've got. So. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and jump in and get started. And of course, welcome to all friends of Delaware County Institute of Science. And I know we've got family and friends of those on board as well. So if you're a family member or friend and are looking specifically for someone that's on the ship, you can go ahead and type that name in the chat and we'll we'll see if they're, uh, if they're currently on shift or uh, if I can swing by and try to see them too. So let's go ahead. I always like to start with a visual with any class that I teach. And so, um, so I'm starting with this inflatable globe that I brought with me. And this is typically the first introduction we get to planet Earth when we're in grade school, right? So we'll have something on the wall or we'll have a globe like this where every country is a different color. So what we're looking at when we're first introduced to thinking about planet Earth is what we call the political geography. So looking at the separation of our planet based on or culture, um, et cetera. What I do like about this globe, though, is that there's a lot of blue on it, and it's all one color blue, and yes, we have one ocean on our planet. Sometimes you'll hear we have multiple oceans. Well, it's one ocean, one body of water that circulates through a lot of ocean basins. So when we say Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, we're just talking about geographic regions that might have some unique circulation patterns going on, but it is one ocean covering 71% of our planet, but scientists will tell you, even though it's such a large feature on our planet, we only really have explored about 20% of it. There is still a lot of ocean we have to learn and to understand. So that's one of the reasons we're out here now. So let me put this globe down and we'll keep going. So when we talk about trying to learn about planet Earth and what's happening, um, I like to use this visualization. And uh, we use this a lot in our Earth science courses to talk to students about planet Earth and, and thinking about Earth as a system. So thinking about how we have that air envelope or the atmosphere around our planet. We have the water part of our planet, not just the ocean, but fresh water and frozen water we find in glaciers and sea ice. So the water part of what we call the hydrosphere. Then we've got the living part of the planet, not just the macro scale, but the micro scale and plants and animals, all of that comprise Again, this living part or the biosphere. And then the lithosphere, that hard rocky part or the land for our planet. And all of these together are a much better way for us to think about planet Earth because our air circulates around the planet. Water continues to flow across the boundaries, across nations. And so we really should be thinking about how all of these kind of combine and interact with each other. Another way that we can actually look at the planet too if we try to look at, if we want to break it down by colors, this is another way geologists will typically look at the planet. And it's what this is, is a plate tectonic map. So the outermost surface of our planet is known as the crust. And that crust is broken into segments. There are solid rigid segments of the crust. And then between the boundaries of the crust is where we've got the activity happening, right? We've got volcanic eruptions, we've got earthquakes, um, so all the boundaries between these colored areas are representing something going on with, uh, within our crust, something's happening. And then the solid colors are where we have areas that 
we say are more tectonically stable. So for those of you in Pennsylvania, notice that you are in the middle of what we call the North American plate. So at the edges of the North American plate, a lot's going on. And you can see the boundary, I'll bring the a little bit closer here. So the boundary on the west coast of the United States, where we have earthquakes, right? We've got the volcanoes of the of Mount St. Helens, right? Mount Hood in Oregon. So a lot more tectonic activity there, not so much on the east coast, but in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is where we do have a plate boundary that goes down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We don't see it because again, it's at the ocean floor, but this boundary here down the middle is actually uh, an area that we're interested in and where we actually are focusing this particular expedition. So uh, this expedition is taking place on this ship here. That's the Joides Resolution and I'll talk more about the ship. We actually can't uh, travel the entire ship. <laughs> it's a pretty big ship, uh, but we will see parts of this again. So this is the vessel that I'm currently on and we'll go to the front of the ship and, and visit that drilling derrick in a little bit. Uh, but what we're doing on the ship is, and this logo that you see here, this is what we call our expedition patch. So we are on Expedition 390 for the International Ocean Discovery Program. So this ship is supported by international scientists and crew that are on a mission that started uh, exactly a month ago. We boarded the ship, actually. So this is a two-month expedition. We started in Cape Town, South Africa, and we sailed from South Africa going across the plate boundary. So you're looking at a cross-sectional view. You're not looking top down like the last map I showed you. So if we actually could cut into the Earth's crust and see what was going on inside. We actually sailed over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and then we're actually collecting materials through the sediments and through the rocks, these crustal basement rocks of the ocean floor. So we're actually coring through here. So we're collecting continuous cores going down through the sediment into the rock and there's a couple things we're interested in. So at these tectonic boundary, the boundary that's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a lot of volcanism going on. This is where new ocean crust is formed. And we know that it's younger towards the, the source of the volcano. And as those lavas cool and solidify on the ocean floor, they get older the further away you go. So we understand that age model, but what we don't have a good understanding on is how those rocks change as they age. We know they get older, but what happens to them chemically? What happens to them physically? What happens as water is circulating through the sediments and the crust and that superheated water down here that's flowing through? What changes are happening to our crustal rocks? And so we're interested in looking at that story on this expedition. We're also interested in, you can kind of hopefully see this magnifying glass here. It's got little microbes in it. The magnifying glass is helping us to understand what is living in these rocks. So not just what living on, on the ocean floor, we're interested in what's living in the ocean floor. So what's in these sediments? What's in the rocks? And again, how does that change through time? So is it the same life assemblages here? Uh, is the distribution and the age of it uh, change? Again, big questions. We just don't know because we've never sampled these areas before. So this is part of our overarching mission is we need to be able to collect the samples uh, from down in our ocean to be able to answer the questions of some of this. And you might be saying, well, why are we interested? You know, who cares about what's living so far down when it's so far away from us? Sure, one of it is pure discovery, asking questions about what's in our ocean and what we don't know. Another thing is though, when you think about what NASA is doing right now, NASA is looking at other planets and what they're trying to do is determine does life exist? And not life that has two arms and two legs and a head, but looking at microscopic life. And what NASA does is what we call um, use planetary analogs. So we look at how we understand systems, as I talked about already, how the systems work on Earth, and we apply that to other planets to give us an idea of maybe where we could look and what we could look for. So because there is so much life that we don't understand in our deep oceans, we're trying to get a better understanding now so that we can then apply that to when we're looking at other planets to see what's there and what isn't there. So that's just one example of, of groups that are interested in what we've got going. So what I'm going to do now is get ready to start moving you around the ship. Uh, if you have any questions right at this moment about what I've explained, go ahead and put them in the chat while I go secure my globe so it doesn't roll around the ship and go grab my hard hat and then we'll start walking. So Dan, if you could just keep an eye on the chat for me while I go secure my stuff.
anything yet? Doesn't look like it. All right, so let's go ahead. Nothing yet, so let's go ahead and start going for a walk. Okay, so we are on the top level or the bridge level of the ship, and I like to stop at this map here. Uh, so this map has a lot of dots on it, and I'll get a little closer to the map in a sec. Uh, this represents every place in our ocean that we have collected these core samples, so that we've actually gone down underneath our ship and select these, these cylinders of sediment and rock to bring back. We started collecting these materials back in 1968. There was a ship that was called Glomar Challenger, and it was the first scientific drilling vessel uh, that was ever built. And what that ship did was sail across our ocean basins and collect these materials. That ship was then retired, and this ship was built and has been on the water. Uh, it was built in 1978. So this ship has been around. Uh, it's getting close to 50 years old. Uh, but I'm just going to go up a little closer and talk about the amazing information that we have learned from going to all these places in the ocean. So you see there's a lot of dots in the Pacific Ocean. I'm going to pan across to the North Atlantic Ocean. And, and here you can see that, that plate boundary where we've got all that volcanic activity and earthquakes. That's shown really nicely on this map. And then I'm going to go down to the South Atlantic Ocean uh, where we don't have as many dots. And, and that's kind of a shame. We are going actually to this area here, which is where Glomar Challenger went on its third expedition. So its third expedition was also in 1968, and it collected the materials. So it actually collected the materials we needed to understand seafloor spreading, what goes on at this boundary, and to prove the theory of plate tectonics. And so we're going back and revisiting this area now with much better technology than they had in 68 and with new research questions. So it's really exciting to be a part of what we're calling this legacy expedition or the tribute back to Glomar Challenger. So I'm going to walk and talk a little bit more. If it gets a little wobbly, again, I apologize. We are on a ship that is on the water. And the name Challenger might sound familiar to you if you're an oceanography fan, the very first oceanographic research expedition. So the first expedition dedicated to research happened exactly 150 years ago. The name of that ship, HMS Challenger. So this is what you've all come to see. Goshen. I'll leave it here just for a sec because this is this is the big ooh and ah moment here. We've got a lot of water. <laughs> we have seen some wildlife out here. Uh, when we first left Cape Town, we saw a humpback whale. We saw a mola fish. We saw penguins. There are penguins in South Africa. Uh, albatross. Since we've been out, it took us nine days to transit to our location where we're collecting material. We've seen a uh, Fair number of seabirds. We are seeing whales once in a while, and uh, every so often a ghost ship that goes by. But pretty much, it's us in this incredible. Uh, it's just incredible the sense of scale, realizing how giant our ocean is. All right, I'm going to stop here for the first part. Of one of my duties on the ship is I actually give tours like this to school groups, community groups, whoever wants to see and learn about scientific ocean drilling. I always talk about safety. We're, I find a lot of the younger kids are a little afraid of going out on the water. Do you need to know how to swim? How safe is it to be on a ship? And safety is such a top priority here. So what you're looking at is one of our four uh, lifeboats. These, the lifeboats on the ship are completely enclosed and we have double the capacity. So this ship holds a maximum of 120 people. So that's crew and scientists. Uh, we have 113 actually on this expedition. Each one of these boats will hold 70 people and we go through drills every single week. Like when you're in elementary school and you have a fire drill, uh, we go through an abandoned ship drill. We do go through fire drills. And so you have to get your survival suit, your life jacket, all of that to, uh, and go through these practice drills. So safety is a top priority because uh, we need to be able to take care of ourselves out here. We're pretty far away from help coming and getting us. It's a little loud through here, so I'm just going to walk quickly.
all sorts of noises on the ship. We are currently walking towards the bow or the front of the ship. And I'm just going to take a quick peek around the corner so you can see what it looks like out the front. Got some engine noises going on. Um, I'll explain those noises in a sec, but I just also want to kind of scan across so and get a look at this view. The sunsets and sunrises are pretty spectacular out here. The noise you're hearing is for a type of engine we have under the ship. Uh, we've got thrusters that are underneath the ship. So we're trying to collect material going down vertically from the top of the water uh, going down to the ocean floor and then into the ocean floor. So what we have are 12 thrusters underneath the ship that actually will fire um, in, different in different directions uh, to be able to stabilize the ship. Because again, as you can see a little bit maybe, we're moving up and down, right? The ocean, you've got the water, uh, the wind blowing across the water, creating the waves, creating a swell. So the ship heaves, heaves meaning moving up and down on the water. This is a very low heave day. So we're excited because uh, less interference with our, our collecting of core material. We're going to jump into here for a sec before we continue to the back of the ship. So welcome to the bridge. So we are now on the bridge of Joydee's Resolution and we've got our first guest on the tour. Best for first instead of best for last, maybe. <laughs> this is Captain Robinson, who is the captain of Joydee's Resolution. So we've got friends, family of Delaware County Institute of Science and people on board the ship. So <laughs> thank you for your time today. So can you tell us maybe a little bit about your views of the ship and being the captain of a whole group of scientists? <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> uh, so scientists, I, the ship in particular is pretty unique as far as ships go. Uh, and there are other research posts about the bit, but then also having a, a drilling package um, kind of makes us a bit unique to where we go and how we operate and hanging out at the sea for an extended period of time. Scientists can actually make it very interesting, sometimes a lot of fun. Um, yeah, ultimately they're very nice to have on board. Some of the, some of the fun parts most of them are very excited to be out here. And it's one we get going. They're usually very excited, very curious. It's fun to have around, kind of show them around. It also does raise uh, safety issues and concerns sometimes, just because they're not used to being at sea and uh, they may not always recognize where they're not supposed to go. Yeah, you're part, you're not saying me, Captain. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone's license and the lost. It's uh, but we get found eventually. So we haven't lost anyone yet, right? On the expedition. No. All right. So one thing uh, the captain likes to show the the school groups that we've had come through, and we have actually already connected with uh, two of the grades at Media Elementary School. So always likes to point out how do we actually steer the ship. So I think even adults might like to see that. So steering wheel. <laughs> That's how we steer. That's it. Pretty small. I think a lot of people are surprised at how small it is, considering what you always see in a Hollywood film and such. But <laughs> pretty small, but lots of instrumentation to help with navigation. Um, pretty much anything you need to get make this ship go. <laughs> and you work, uh, oh, you work on the ship. So every two months, so you rotate. Off, so you're not on this ship in the middle of the ocean for no, years forever, at a time. No. <laughs> uh, uh, pretty much the whole crew works in two months rotation. So. Uh, every port call, we come into port every two months, we'll do a full crew change, and the other crew will come on. And call. So that's the same thing with the scientists. So we're out here, as I mentioned, uh, we left, we actually boarded the ship exactly a month ago. And uh, we've been on the ship, and then we will get back to Cape Town. We're docking on June 7th. I believe that's still the plan. Still the plan. Okay. <laughs> and then everyone comes off the ship, and a whole fresh group comes out uh, to continue on. The captain will eventually come back in two months. I will be back home in Pennsylvania and still trying to get my land lines back maybe. <laughs> Hopefully it won't take that long. All right. Thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. We're going to continue on to the science lab. Thank you. All right.
right. So we're heading now down towards the center of the ship, and I'm going to try to get this in the view. I'm going to start from back here because it is uh, so tall. <laughs> this is our tower or our drilling derrick. This is where the activity takes place for us to be able to have the power and be able to send out enough pipe and enough material uh, to be able to, to collect the material we need. I do see there's a question in the chat. Formation tectonic plates affect weather or calmness. Uh, they will not affect weather or calmness that we are certainly experiencing. So that new volcanic activity that's happening at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, there is new material always erupting, but it's not erupting like a volcano, like when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980 or when Kilauea's had its eruptions. It's a very, very slow eruption. And the movement of the plates is incredibly slow as well. So the movement of the plates is about the same as the rate that your fingernail grows. It's actually only a couple centimeters a year. So, so there's not a lot that's going on there. In terms of hurricanes, hurricanes are an atmospheric disturbance that occurs um, from the atmosphere, uh, from the winds and such that then are interacting with the warmer waters. So the tectonics uh, do not connect to those, but uh, it's something certainly that we need to pay attention to. Now, usually in the Southern Atlantic Ocean, we don't have hurricanes. Most of those are in the Northern Atlantic, but the South Atlantic did have a hurricane uh, back in 2020, which was the original sailing date for this expedition. So uh, it's something certainly that we pay attention to what's going on with the weather. But today, not a bad day to be on the water. So let's go ahead towards the derrick. And again, this is gonna be one of the noisy parts of the ship. We are currently coring through material. We are on our second site that we're trying to collect material. And what we're bringing up is a lot of sediment. So that top sediment package I showed you on top of the, that rocky crust. So the sediments are materials that either are coming off of land. It's from organisms in the, in the ocean that uh, once they die, will settle down into the sea floor and it just accumulates over time. So here's some of our engineers. Let me see if I can go. Oh, and then all the way down towards the back, which again, we're not gonna go to the back of the ship. That's where our uh, helicopter pad is. And the helicopter pad, we are not using on this expedition. We are actually too far away from land for a helicopter to get to us. Uh, they have used it though, uh, if there ever has been an extreme medical emergency or apparently one time a parts broke on the stove in the mess hall. And so they needed to fix the kitchen. So they actually flew out apart. Uh, nowadays, people just use it for exercise. If you wanna do a 5K on this ship, you actually run around the, the helicopter pad about 79 times. But you don't have to do that. We do have treadmills on the ship too. We have a whole exercise room <laughs> that people can go in. Uh, we also have a movie room on the ship too. So the ship, I'll just point out while this is going on here too. So you see this pipe that's spinning. That pipe that's spinning is actually what's uh, coring down into our ocean sediments at this time. And it goes down through, uh, through that point and then down out an opening in the bottom of the ship. So what we're doing is currently collecting material. Right now, uh, the water depth we're at is about 5,000 meters deep. So it depends on your water depth is also how long this process will take. We're about every two hours getting some fresh core material coming up. So it's keeping everyone in the science lab really busy. The scientists on board work 12 hour shifts. So we work 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And what that means is I am uh, working, I start my shift at 12 noon and I work till 12 midnight. Then at 12 midnight, someone else comes on and will run tours of the ship, take care of the social media, et cetera. So, you work opposite ships with people on the ship. We run 24 seven. So we don't get weekends off, we don't get evenings off. But then again, where are we gonna go, right? <laughs> Had a whole lot that we could do. Right, I'm going downstairs. So I will wait to explain a little more. I mentioned that there's a movie room on the ship. Um, we do not have television coverage on the ship. So we'll talk about the space in a sec here. 
So the length of the ship, just so you know, is the length of five basketball courts or 470 feet. That drilling tower that I just showed you is the height of 200 feet or about 20 basketball hoops. And I like to talk about basketball because it is the NBA playoffs. The Sixers are in the playoffs and I can't watch any basketball games. No live TV, no YouTube, no Netflix. <laughs> it may sound rough, <laughs> but it's not that bad. We've got enough to keep us busy here. And again, a lot of other activities. We celebrate birthdays. Uh, so it's, it's great being together with people on the ship. We find enough uh, to keep busy. And of course, we have email access back home. So I wanted to show this to you. I want to especially uh, point your attention to, to this gold one right here and then the silver one. The silver one is the correct orientation for what we call our drill bit. And so that's actually what's at the bottom of that pipe that I just showed you. And that's on the ocean floor. And that is what is spinning and rotating. So that's spinning and rotating. And then each of these knobs that you see on top also spin and rotate. So those are actually trying to break up the material uh, that then will go into a core liner. So we send these plastic core liners down the middle. Let's see if I can see. There we go. There's a hole down the middle. So it breaks up all the material around it. We send down the core liner with the pipe and then bring that back up. And then we bring that up and we lay it out here. We're collecting about 9.5 meters of core at a time. So we go down a little bit, bring it up, go down again, even deeper, bring it up. It gets laid out here and then we bring it into the core lab. So I'm now going to take you indoors to the core lab. This is where the science happens. This is a super busy place. Uh, we've had nothing but core coming up uh, for the past couple of days. Um, oh, and we've got a friend of Claire. She's on the tour. We've got her as a stop on the tour. So we'll make sure we stop by to see Claire today. Um, I just want to show you one of the rooms. When I talk to some groups, I, I really want to emphasize too, we are in the middle of the ocean. So we can't just run to Lowe's or Home Depot to pick up something we might need. Uh, we can't go to the Geek Squad at Best Buy to fix our computers for us. So we actually are, we, we have uh, computer programmers on the ship. We have IT people. We have incredibly creative problem solvers and also a lot of materials and supplies. So what we do is we just make sure that if there's a challenge we have, uh, we're great at repurposing what we have and, and finding those solutions. And so... Uh, so that's really a, a fun part too. In addition to the other people that support us, like our chefs, you know, in the dining hall, um, and others that take care. So, so this is some of the one of the areas where we actually study our physical properties, and we've got some people looking at physical properties now, looking at some of the the core material that's coming up. So here are some of the tubes of core. So it looks like a lot of mud. I'll show you some of this on outside the tubes as well. But again, we've got these sections of core that we're looking at. And the first thing we do is we'll do some measurements on the entire core, then we'll split them up and we'll actually then look at what's on the inside. That gives us the best opening. So I'm going to quickly dash down, excuse me. And so this is one of the areas where we are looking at the core material. So every core that we pull up from the ocean, we split in half. And so for that half, half of it is what we call our working area. And so that's what's going on here. We've got some people that are looking. <laughs> that's Kiho there, who I've been working with. Uh, I abandoned him so I could help with the tour, but I'll get, I'll get back there, Kiho. <laughs> and uh, so what we're looking at is some of the mud that we've actually pulled up. So we're seeing some layers of clay. We're seeing some layers of carbonate, again, trying to figure out uh, what is down there and then we collect samples and we do some analyses on it. So we describe the sediments that we see. We're looking at what we call the paleomagnetic signature too. We're looking to see um, those reversals of Earth's magnetic field, where that is contained within there as well. We've got some core material being prepared over here that once it's cut, we scrape it, make sure we've got a flat surface before we do some imaging on it. That's one of the areas I'm working in this lab is doing some of the imaging, um, doing some of those initial scans. And then we've got people that are 
looking at thin sections. Uh, we've got, here's our magnetometer <laughs> that's measuring, <laughs> that's measuring some of the material. Paleomagnetist is telling me to get away from the magnetometer because the Wi-Fi is not kind to it. We've got a whole area here of microscopes uh, that we actually do, again, everything from <laughs> thin sections. Pamela there is one of our, what we call our hard rock people. She's the one that studies uh, the basalts and that material from our ocean floor. So she's now going through all the data that she's been able to collect on from, from the last core that we've been able to bring together. And so I'm going down to the end to see, are you ready? I, you're in demand, Claire, so I want to make sure. <laughs> In the chat, your name's appearing. Okay. <laughs> Claire is one of our micropaleontologists, and she specifically studies nanofossils. And so what I'm going to do is just come over to Claire and let her explain who she is and what she does. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, so I think I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction there. So I um, basically I take a sample from each core that we have uh, recovered, and I look at the microfossils and try and gauge the age. So we're looking for key species um, that are good age, uh, age determinants. And that'll help us uh, with our post-cruise uh, sampling, um, because a lot of us are interested in ocean and climate interactions and sort of what's happened in the past. And to do that, we need to have a good gauge on on where we are in stratigraphy. I always mix up that word. Um, so yeah, then here's some. Yeah, of so the, what do we have here? This is um, some of it's quite still today. The boat's not moving so much, so it's not yeah. changing focus. Um, but we're looking at an oligocene sample here. So these are all calcareous uh, nanofossils. Their range in size between about 3 and 30 microns. So I'm looking at this under a 1,000 times magnification. So you have a microscope on the ship that lets you magnify things a 1,000 times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and we are really, Andrew and I were just talking before because we're really excited. We are about to come, um, so the, we caught obviously from the most recent down um, through time. And we are about to cross the Eocene Oligocene transition. I think it should be in the next core or so. Um, and that is basically an interval of time where we, we had extreme um, extreme warmth. So we had a high uh, carbon dioxide and the atmosphere was extremely warm. Um, and then we go into a, an interval where Antarctica is isolated, Antarctica develops these um, permanent ice sheets, and um, ocean circulation really changes. And so we can see that in our microfossils and then also um, in, in, carbon, in isotopes, I guess. And um, we've noticed a little bit in, in mythology out here. Um, so yes, we're quite excited and we're eagerly anticipating it. <laughs> Great. If anyone has any questions for Claire, oh, please ask her if she would consider presenting at Delaware County Institute of Science via Zoom next year. <laughs> You're, someone wants to sign you up for a lecture already. <laughs> no problem, sure. Contact my agent. <laughs> <laughs> if scientists had agents. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no problem. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you for that. Enjoy Appreciate that. So we continue to go through here. And that course coming up soon, it looks like, right? Or no, we're go still going down? Yeah, it's on its way down. It's on its way down. So we have TV screens all over the ship that are tuned into drill floor television network. And so what this does is it shows us the activity going on on the drill floor, and then there's a counter in the upper right-hand corner, and that just lets us know the numbers as the core is going down versus the core coming up, and that lets us know when we need to get out there uh, to prepare to, to collect samples and collect material. So. We are currently boxing up some of the core material here, uh, material that we've already looked at that is now going to go downstairs into our refrigerator. We get asked that a lot. So we look at these cores and then what happens to them. So uh, the cores are actually going to go down. And then uh, once we get into port, then they're removed from the ship and they go to one of three places. So there are core repositories or what we call core libraries in essence. Uh, in three different places. One is at Texas A&M University. That will typically have the cores collected, Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic, uh, I'm sorry, in part of the Pacific. And then we've got Brennan, Germany, which is one of the uh, core repositories we have that has the cores from the Atlantic Ocean. And we have another core repository in Japan. That's where we will put the cores from the Western Pacific Ocean. So uh, again, it's an international effort, uh, international teams that are 
that have come together to be able to uh, to be able to make the science happen on the ship. Uh, I'm just going to stop here in the stairwell uh, for the pet ball. So there are no animals on the ship. A lot of people are leaving their pets back home, but this is a tradition on every expedition. Uh, just to, again, kind of celebrate a little bit and share um, part of our own lives as well. So because all the scientists here, including the crew, right, we've all left um, families and friends back home. So the pet ball is something that's always popular. I'm going to continue down the stairwell a little bit here to one more level. Um, and I'm going to show you these are all, I, I guess the best way to describe it is contest winners. So every expedition that the ship has gone out on, they're including the Glomar Challenger, so the ship before us. So in 1968, they actually started a competition on the ship for each two-month expedition that we have. Who can actually draw a logo that captures uh, either what happened on the ship or something fun? So. Uh, there's one I want to show you, this one here, uh, this one you can see the dates on it from 2021, uh, and even though it says uh, it started in, uh, or it ended in Iceland, it started in South Africa, went up to Iceland, uh, they put a sea turtle on there because during that expedition, uh, there was a net that drifted by the ship that a sea turtle was caught in, so actually, uh, even though the ship was able to continue doing their operations, they were able to capture and then uh, cut free that sea turtle so it could uh, so it could escape. So that's kind of how they dedicated <laughs> their logo uh, that they drew. That was their contest winner. And here are some of the older ones. You can see they were in black and white, but going back. And then what happens is towards the end of the expedition, uh, we have we vote on the winner and then they get screen printed on t-shirts that we all take home with us. So kind of another fun personal touch as we're out here on the water. We're not going to go into too many more labs, but for those that are interested in the geology part, we do have an X-ray diffractometer. We have a thin section lab. This is our geochemistry lab, which looks like any other geochem lab you might have, except we have a lot of bungee cords and Velcro securing our equipment. So <laughs> in case we do hit rough waters, uh, we don't have to worry about that material um, flying around on us. This is our conference room. I'm going to show you some pictures in a sec. Uh, we do, in addition to having the computer and IT people on board, um, we've got the chefs on board. Uh, we do have a full-time medical doctor. So in here is kind of our mini hospital. Um, if, again, there was a medical emergency, we would be able to take care of that here on the ship. So fortunately, um, I think our doctor has been uh, quite bored during this expedition, which is good. Uh, we actually want an expedition that doesn't have a lot of emergencies. So I'm gonna flip this around, take the hard hat off because now I'm back in a safe area here. And one thing I wanted to show you that's another fun activity that we do on the ship. Uh, you might have seen this um, in other places on ships where they do these shrinking styrofoam cups. So this is a fun activity we like to do uh, for the kids as well that we connect with. We show them a styrofoam cup. Styrofoam cups are about 90% air in between all these styrofoam beads that make up the cup. And what you can do is you can take a cup and if you send it down in the ocean, so down in the water, and what we do is we attach it, we put it in some bags and we attach it to our uh, video camera that will send down. Uh, so as we're looking for where we're going to be uh, surveying and sampling on the ocean floor. And what happens is the pressure from all that over overlying water will shrink the cup. Uh, to something that's pretty small. And so uh, for Delaware County Institute of Science, I actually decorated a cup. I don't know if you can see it, but it says DCIS lecture series. Um, and then I put this particular lecture on it and the date. So I have shrunk a cup for DCIS. If you would like this as part of your collection, um, you can have it. So this cup has been to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. So we try to, so that's another one of those kind of fun activities we do when we're out here. Uh, we don't really use styrofoam cups for anything else, though. We are very um, aware of trying to be green in terms of our practices on the ship. So we minimize waste and use because we have to keep that all with us. We do not put garbage into the ocean. Uh, so we recycle everything, meaning we bring it back to land and then we will dispose of it properly, too. So, uh, so that's an important part of our time on the ship as well. So... I'm going to pause and see if there are any other questions that people might have. I don't see any in the chat right now, but what I will do as you're thinking of questions, 
One question I get asked a lot is, where do you live on the ship and what happens? And so what I'm sharing here is an image of what our staterooms look like. So you, everyone on the ship shares with someone else and you're, that person you're sharing with works the opposite 12 hour shift as you. So one person has the room all to themselves for 12 hours and they could sleep for 12 hours. They could sleep and then read. Uh, there is a desk in the room as well. Those rock lockers are where we keep our clothing. And then there is a bathroom that is shared with the room next door. So you can see on the upper bunk too, uh, there's some bars because again, this ship has traveled in all ocean basins. So uh, you might uh, hit some rough water. So that's there for your protection. Uh, but that's one thing uh, that again, kind of another safety precaution, uh, but how we actually, uh, where we live on the ship, uh, where do we eat? We uh, eat in our dining hall, which is just like a cafeteria. Uh, one thing that's special, our chefs are absolutely amazing. They are trained to actually make food on, on the water on a moving ship. So this is our dessert every Saturday, lava cake. The Joyce Resolution is known for their lava cake. Uh, we do have an ice cream machine, a cappuccino machine. Uh, <laughs> we had a barbecue. So Saturday's our barbecue day. It was wonderful brisket that we had. So... We've got, uh, so if anyone's curious, we are eating well, that's for sure. We are fed incredibly well, uh, food uh, from all different cultures, because this is a ship, again, that has people from all different cultures and nations, too. Any questions I can answer? It is a lot, that's for sure, to, to go over this ship and everything that we're doing. What's the dominant sediment in the cores? Does it vary a lot? It, it's it's varying. I mean, we've got particularly right now, we've got a lot of clays. We were excited to get to the carbonates because that let us know we're kind of hitting an age transition boundary. So so it changes through there, but uh, you saw a lot of tan colored material. Uh, so that's what we were. And then with the hard rock material, that was pretty much all the salt <laughs> that we're finding here, which is not surprising. That is what you're going to find at an area that has volcanism. Uh, down on the ocean floor. Let me see if there's any other photos. I think I got through all the photos. Those are the important ones that people want to see. Yeah, I think that's about it. There's no other questions than Jeremiah. Um, actually, before we turn it off. Uh, Dan, can you also put in the chat, uh, there's a web page, and Lauren, I see your question. I'm definitely going to get uh, get to that. So Dan has put two links into the chat. The first one is our expedition uh, web page. So we have a page that gives a summary of our expedition, and at the bottom of that page are the blog posts that myself and another person have been putting together uh, so that people can learn a little bit more about what we're doing. So that first link is something that we are keeping active and updated. One of the items on that page, which has been kind of fun, is that we've uh, created a Google Earth interface where each day we're updating our geographic position in Google Earth. And when you click on the place mark, it actually opens up and has a photo and then a short description of something that happened on the previous day. So if you're curious where we are in the water and you want to track us, you can click on the link to the Google Earth files that is on that expedition page towards the bottom. The second link is for anyone that is interested at any time uh, for signing up for a tour of the ship. So we do tours for school groups mostly, but we also do tours for community groups, for organizations. Uh, anyone that wants to see the ship, we're here to tell people about this. This is a wonderful opportunity to learn a little bit more about the process of science and how we do research at sea and how we live at sea too. <laughs> There's a lot that goes on here. So we are so far away from land for two months, but we wanna be able to connect with everyone. The tours are free. So if you go to that particular link, you can sign up either during this expedition or any future expeditions. Again, this ship keeps going out of port every two months. So year round, uh, you can actually sign up for a tour uh, with your group and then uh, get that information. So Lauren asks, how is the bedrock kept together structurally during drilling? So it's pretty much a, a solidified unit, but there are fractures within there. And so when you do have that rotating barrel, it will break. So sometimes we get these little disks of basalt, uh, which are a little tricky when we try to do the scanning and the splitting of them as well. Uh, but there are some sections of basalt that we get that are just really nice thick pieces too. 
So it, our drillers are really good at, at being able to sense when the drill bit's having some problems breaking through the material or when they need to replace the drill bit. Those drill bits you saw on the deck uh, have lasted anywhere from 60 to 80 hours for us. Uh, once it drills for 60 to 80 hours, uh, then we'll retire it. We'll put a new one on there. So uh, they've actually been really helpful and productive for us in being able to bring back entire sections. So yeah, that basalt, actually, that bedrock material, uh, so far has been pretty kind to us. We've been pretty lucky. Okay, without further questions, Jeremiah, I will turn this back over to you. I think we're good. Oh, Thank Jeremy. you. <laughs> yep. So if there's any questions, certainly you can contact me on that page that says for tours. There's an email address where you can email the ship with any further questions or if you want to con get more info on signing up for a future tour, uh, just let us know. I'm on the ship again till June 9th, but the ship will be turning around and going back out a couple of days after that, or June 7th, and then going back out probably on the 9th. So, uh, so thank you everyone for joining us from the South Atlantic Ocean. Hope you enjoyed the tour today, and I look forward to seeing everyone. My neighbors back in Pennsylvania, I'll be there soon enough. I'll be there in a month. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>